I just want to start by welcoming Dr. Rob Knight to our Lunch and Learn series today. We are very honored and privileged to have him join us and present about the role of the microbiome in aging and Alzheimer's disease. The Alzheimer's Gut Microbiome Project is what he'll be focusing on, and that's a study that is currently underway here at the UCSD ADRC site. So we're excited to be a part of that initiative. And just a brief introduction um, from his bio, Dr. Knight is the founding director of the Center for Microbiome Innovation and professor of pediatrics and computer science and engineering at UC San Diego. Before that, he was professor of chemistry and biochemistry and computer science in the BioFrontiers Institute of the University of Colorado at Boulder and an HHMI early career scientist. He's a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and the American Academy of Microbiology. He was honored with the 2019 NIH Director's Pioneer Award for his microbiome research and received the 2017 Mastery Prize, often considered a predictor of the Nobel. In 2015, he received the Vilsack Prize in Creative Promise for the Life Sciences and he has authored The Follow Your Gut, The Enormous Impact of Tiny Microbes, and co-authored a book called Dirt is Good, The Advantage of Germs for Your Child's Developing Immune System. He has given numerous presentations, including a TED Talk in 2014. His lab has produced many of the software tools and lab techniques that have enabled high throughput microbiome science, and he's co-founder of the Earth Microbiome Project, the American Gut Project, and the company Biota, Inc., which uses DNA from microbiomes in the subsurface to guide oil field decisions. Um, a really extensive bio, clearly really accomplished researcher and scholar. We are very honored to have you here today and appreciate your time during such a busy influx in the COVID situation. So with that said, um, Thank you and welcome, and I'll mute myself. Uh, thanks, Christina, for that very kind introduction. And uh, thank you all for uh, coming along today and uh, also for your partnership in the, um, in, in the U19 uh, Alzheimer's uh, Gut Microbiome Project funded by, uh, uh, funded by NIA. Uh, we really appreciate your partnership in this, uh, in this very important effort. And uh, I hope today's talk uh, will, will help clarify why we're doing this work, um, uh, uh, what, what role, uh, what role um, our local ADRC is playing in it, and, uh, uh, and um, uh, identify ways that we can work together uh, more efficiently, especially, um, uh, especially uh, giving a better understanding of why we're requesting the biospecimens we are. Uh, I, I, decided to, uh, I, I decided to give a broader focus um, uh, talk, uh, given, the, given the launch and learn format, uh, to put what we're doing more in context with um, with, with nutrition and uh, the gut microbiome and metabolism, and then uh, tie that all together with how that uh, how that fits into uh, aging research and to Alzheimer's disease specifically. And uh, I'm also intentionally trying to leave plenty of time for questions, uh, so that um, so that we can have some uh, dialogue around uh, any of these topics. Um, so, uh, so first off, the human microbiome is incredibly complex, and uh, through uh, through recent advances in high throughput sequencing, we're really just starting to get uh, an understanding of the uh, of the full level of this complexity. Um, and uh, it's so com uh, it's so complex that it's even starting to change our view of uh, who we are as human beings. So, I'd like you to consider for a moment what you saw when you looked in the mirror as you were um, as you were getting up this morning. Uh, getting ready to uh, come into work, or perhaps getting ready to uh, spend a long day sitting in front of Zoom, as the case may be. Um, for myself, I saw an organism that's just 43% human, and not just because it was early and I hadn't had my coffee yet, but uh, when we think of what makes up our bodies at the level of cells, each of us has about 30 trillion human cells, but amazingly, uh, we have about 39 trillion microbial cells, and uh, that's where that, uh, mostly bacteria in the gut, that's where that 43% human number comes from. Now you might think, well, it's the 21st century, uh, shouldn't, we think, uh, shouldn't we think about this not in terms of counting cells, 
but at the genetic level in terms of our genomes and our DNA. And uh, when we think about that uh, in terms of microbes, it becomes even more remarkable because uh, I'm sure you've all heard that the human gene catalog consists of about 20,000 human genes, more or less. Astonishingly, the microbial gene catalog consists of somewhere between two and 20 million microbial genes. Uh, again, the vast majority of these being carried by, uh, by bacteria in our gut, but there's also all kinds of other things in there like archaea, uh, fungi, viruses, uh, protists for some people, and so on. And so, uh, and so by that measure, uh, the, by the measure of unique genes, uh, the enzymes they encode, uh, the epitopes by which they can interact with our immune system, you could say that we're just 1% human at best. And uh, what's perhaps most remarkable about this is not just that when we do uh, genetic research focused on the human genome, that we're ignoring uh, most of the unique genes associated with our bodies, but uh, beyond, uh, beyond neglecting the vast majority of the system that makes up our, uh, our, uh, our, uh, our separate organism, uh, the genes that we're ignoring are the genes that we can change. So those microbial genes have changed for each of us profoundly from the moment we were delivered uh, through the first uh, through the first three years of life, where uh, most of the mo most microbial change happens very rapidly, and they continue to change uh, as we age, even into old age. And so uh, one one thing that's fascinating as a concept is that if we could take control of that process of change in our microbial gene repertoire, it could have an enormous impact on healthy aging. So, um, so, so the second, um, so, so the second thing I want to cover, which I think is probably familiar to many of you, uh, although the scope of these linkages may not um, uh, may not be something you've uh, kept up with as, uh, as it's expanded very rapidly in recent years, but the microbiome is linked to diseases and to treatment responses throughout the body, uh, including um, including the brain. And in this respect, it's important to remember that the gut is not vagus uh, and that what happens in the gut does not stay in the gut. And uh, processes that occur in the gut and our gut microbiology can impact, uh, can impact uh, all kinds of things throughout our body. So, uh, so the gut microbiota are uh, an incredibly sensitive, um, uh, sensitive store of information about both what we're exposed to right now at our physiological state right now, and also past influences, including delivery mode, which we've recently shown can have uh, impacts on the gut microbiome even into adulthood in patients with inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, things like diet, including our first diet, like whether we're breastfed or formula fed, uh, exercise, uh, disease, aging, uh, drugs, um, especially, uh, especially medications not traditionally known as antibiotics. Uh, so for example, metformin and proton pump inhibitors both have very large impacts on the gut microbiome. And then geography has a large influence. And we're not sure uh, at this stage how much of that is based on geography per se and how much is specific uh, lifestyle or environmental factors. Uh, but certainly different people around the world have very different microbiomes from one another. And it takes, uh, and it takes a long time to equilibrate after you move to a new situation. So uh, in addition to being a sensor that can read out a, um, a tremendous number of things about our, uh, our current and past activities and, uh, and exposures, um, the gut microbiome also uh, affects a lot of processes, as I mentioned. And so, um, and, and so to take, uh, to take just the uh, example of gut-brain uh, interactions, which there's, a tremendous, um, which there's a tremendous focus on at the moment, uh, not just in our U19, but in a lot of other projects, um, the, the question is not uh, how can the microbiome affect the gut at all, but which of many different pathways that are now uh, well known to occur are important in, um, in informing our view of different diseases. And so uh, the gut microbes can communicate with the brain by, um, by uh, releasing small molecules uh, into, uh, into the bloodstream, which then have an effect on, uh, on, on a wide range of different receptors throughout the body and throughout the brain. Uh, they can signal through the immune system, uh, they can signal through the vagus nerve, and uh, they can also, um, and, uh, they, they can also uh, influence processes like inflammation in the gut itself, 
uh, through things like production of butyrate and other short, fat, uh, short chain fatty acids that feed the gut epithelium and reduce inflammation uh, in ways that uh, in ways that also educate the immune system throughout the body. And so, uh, as as a result, um, as a result, there's an increasing appreciation that the gut can affect uh, all kinds of different uh, distal organs, including the liver, uh, the heart, uh, the kidneys, and the brain. So, um, so the microbiome, in uh, all, in addition to being affected by many drugs, uh, also affects the impact of many drugs as well, uh, stratifying patients for treatment for a wide range of disorders. And uh, this includes uh, this includes analgesics like acetaminophen. Uh, it includes cardiac drugs like digoxin, and uh, cancer treatments ranging from traditional ones like cyclophosphamide and cisplatin uh, to the latest checkpoint inhibitors. So um, PD one PDL one checkpoint inhibition has not only uh, has not only been uh, strongly uh, strongly um, uh, shown to be affected by what microbes you have. But uh, in recent literature, uh, even, um, even concepts like doing fecal transplantation to move someone from the non-responder category to the responder category for uh, checkpoint inhibitor therapy has been, uh, has, has been demonstrated in the literature. And this is very exciting because it suggests that by changing those microbial genes that are involved in drug metabolism, we can have an enormous impact on who will or won't respond to a particular therapy. And uh, one, one thing that we're doing in the U19 is generalizing this concept beyond drugs uh, because, uh, because it may be possible that most of the molecules that we're ingesting, uh, whether they're drugs or whether they're food, um, what impact those molecules have on us is, is, going to be, uh, is, is going to be mediated to a large degree by our gut microbiomes. And um, in this respect, uh, Aaron Segal and his collaborators at the Weissman Institute uh, published an amazing article in Cell back in 2015, where uh, they were able to uh, they, they were able to build a personalized nutrition predictor uh, using um, using an AI model trained on essentially everything they could measure uh, in a sample of 800 people, where, um, where where they measured the microbiome, they did blood tests, they did questionnaires, they did uh, anthropometric measurements, and they did food diaries and out of out of all that, um, when they uh, when when they hooked people up to continuous glucose monitors and fed them a defined sequence of diets for two weeks, they could ask which of these different features corresponded with how uh, each individual dietary item um, in that defined sequence of diets had affected their blood glucose. And uh, what they were able to show is that when they averaged the results for the eight hundred people they studied. Um, of that average level, uh, the glycemic index for each food uh, very nicely matched public values, but the individual glycemic index for individual people um, was, was all over the map. So for example, tomatoes you'd normally consider a healthy food, but there were uh, some individuals where, uh, where, where tomatoes specifically made their blood glucose spike, and when they cut them out of their diet, uh, they did much better. Uh, same, the same was true for beans. Um, there, there were also big differences in whether normal potatoes or sweet potatoes uh, had, um, had, had a high or low glycemic load for individual people. And so, um, and, and so then when they uh, cross-referenced it to everything they measured, they found that the gut microbiome was the most sensitive predictor uh, of all of those individual glycemic responses. And um, amazingly, they found uh, that for some people, at least in terms of blood glucose, it was better to eat ice cream than it was to eat rice. And on learning this, a lot of people have uh, two questions. The first is, is there a test that I can take that lets me tell uh, whether I'm in the, in the ice cream category or the rice category? And the answer is that they, uh, they did not in, in, indeed commercialize this through a company called Day2. Just for full disclosure, I'm on the SAB of that company. But uh, essentially, it, it does that sort of uh, readout from your microbiome where you send them a stool sample, and it tells you in detail uh, what you should eat in terms of blood glucose control, uh, which, as you know, was uh, very important, not just for diabetes, but also for Alzheimer's. But then the second question, which I think is more interesting, uh, is, uh, you know, suppose I find out that I'm in the category of people who should eat ice cream, could I move myself into, uh, sorry, the people who should eat rice, could I move myself into the category of people who should eat ice cream by changing my microbiome? And uh, that's, uh, that, that's something that there's still a lot of research uh, on, it's a very active, um, a very active area. But stories like, um, uh, like uh, from the drug literature of moving, uh, moving mice and then more recently moving people from a non-responder category to a responder category through fecal transplantation or antibiotics or other uh, microbiome-targeted therapies 
make this seem like, uh, like a plausible idea rather than a crazy idea based on the data that's accumulating now. So, um, so, so the uh, so, so one one really important principle in all of this is the microbiome uh, really uh, re really uh, has a profound influence in transforming molecules that we find in food. And so, what I'm showing you here is work that we did with Peter Durstein, who's one of the partners in the uh, in the U19 project. And uh, this is a molecular network where each dot on this diagram uh, represents a mass spectrum of the molecule. And we draw an edge between two of those dots if their uh, similarity in the molecular fragments uh, exceeds a particular uh, score by the cosine measure. And uh, then we build a network out of those graphs, uh, out of those edges, so that the graph basically shows you which molecules are, um, uh, are similar to one another. Uh, and then they're colored according to their source. So they're green if they were found uh, in, in the sample of food that we ran. Um, through the mass spec where uh, Peter and his lab looked at about 5,000 food specimens to build up a database of molecules that are found in food. And then uh, it's brown if we found it coming out the other end in the fecal sample. Uh, and then it's blue if we found that molecule in both locations. And what you can see is that there's not a lot of uh, there's not a lot of blue on this on this plot, and that just speaks to the profound transformation that the food undergoes, uh, largely caused by microbes uh, as that food passes through our digestive tract. And um, when we take this, uh, when we take this inside mice, um, essentially what we did is uh, is uh, took germ-free mice um, labeled here GF from Sarcus masmanian lab at Caltech, uh, and then SPF specific pathogen-free mice from uh, from Victor Nose's lab uh, locally at uh, UC San Diego, and we can uh, we compared the effect that they uh, that we compared the. Um, uh, the, the overall uh, metabolic profiles of these mice through many organs by basically sticking them in a small animal MRI, uh, building a 3D model of the individual mouse, and then dissecting it, uh, running each piece of the mouse through, uh, through the mass spec, which I'm showing you here, and also through sequencing to reveal the microbiome at each location. And uh, we saw, uh, we, and, and you can just see uh, for, these, um, for these molecules that I'm highlighting here, how different they are in their distribution between the germ-free and the SPF mice. And uh, here we're focusing on bile acids. Uh, so you can see a very different bile acid distribution. One thing that was especially um, interesting about this is that we were able to discover a whole lot of new bile acids uh, that were previously unknown to science and then confirm that they occurred not only in mice, uh, but also, um, but also in, in various cohorts uh, that are clinically relevant of human samples, um, so we could uh, so we could uh, gain confidence that those were produced in nature rather than being some artifact of the process. And uh, I won't say too much about this because it's um, it's, it's now published, uh, and um, uh, so this this came out in Nature last year. Goes into detail about the uh, different biotransformations that the gut microbiome as a whole uh, is able to affect. But one thing that's fascinating about um, uh, one, one thing that's fascinating about this data set is that it shows that in organs throughout the mouse, uh, you have a huge impact, even if you have the same diet, on whether or not you have a microbiome. And uh, for example, thirty percent of the molecules in the brain are different depending on whether you have a microbiome or not. So, uh, so one one reason why it's important to study this right now is that we're losing the complexity of our microbiome uh, through through a variety of processes that are linked to industrialization, and this um, and, and this this includes diet, which uh, which is uh, which is one of the things that has the largest effect on the microbiome that we know of. And uh, when we study people who are living very traditional lifestyles, uh, like Hadza hunter-gatherers um, in, in Tanzania, who I've worked with Justin Sonnenberg and, uh, and others on, and uh, had the amazing privilege of visiting the field site uh, in, in 2014, um, what we see is we see incredibly strong seasonality of the microbiome, uh, probably, uh, probably driven by the profound changes in diet. But um, additionally, when we compare the uh, the hunter gatherer microbiome to uh, to other populations around the world, um, in what's called a principal coordinates analysis, where we allow the similarities and differences in the microbiome data to sort out these different populations along an axis, uh, what we see is that the Hadza, as well as other people living very traditional uh, lifestyles, um, such as the Yanomami in Venezuela, um, the um, 
let's see, uh, other groups in Burkina Faso and, and Peru, for example, are on the left-hand side there, whereas, for example, whereas uh, industrialized people in the US, Canada, uh, Europe, Australia, and so on, are way over on the right-hand side, automatically sorted out by the microbiome data. And this is also coupled to a tremendous uh, loss of complexity. So we see entire phyla, like the spirochetes, for example, being prevalent in these populations that have a, a less industrialized lifestyle and absent from populations with a more industrialized lifestyle, uh, which are dominated by uh, members of, uh, of, of the uh, Bacteroidetes and the Varroca microbia, for example, which are relatively rare in uh, non-human primates and also relatively rare in people who are uh, living more traditional lifestyles. Uh, so we're losing a lot of this microbiome complexity, and it's almost as though we're taking this, uh, the, this beautiful, rich inner rainforest of our gut, uh, filled with complexity and different organisms interacting and so on, and bulldozed it and replaced it with a cityscape where you just see the rats and the pigeons and, uh, and not much else. And uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with Rachel Carson's work from the 1960s, um, documenting uh, the, the biodiversity crisis that was then taking place in the, um, in, in the uh, world around us as uh, efforts, um, efforts to control insect pests with DDT uh, had had far-reaching uh, far effects on the ecosystems, um, including, uh, including um, uh, dramatic decreases in, uh, in bird life, for example. And uh, in parallel to this, uh, Marty Blazer, uh, my, um, uh, my good friend and colleague now at, now at Rutgers, wrote a wonderful book uh, just a few years ago documenting the same sort of process for our inner ecosystem. Um, so the book's entitled Missing Microbes, and it goes into detail how not just um, antibiotics, which is what made the cover, but also all kinds of other processes, including C-section, uh, low fiber diets, hyper processed foods, um, all, of these, uh, all, all of these different factors are uh, leading to a depletion of our microbial ecosystems, which is likely to be making us less resilient. And um, of a particular note, uh, these, um, uh, these people living very traditional lifestyles have very low incidences of, uh, of, of inflammatory diseases, including Alzheimer's disease. So these kinds of comparative studies uh, can be very useful for informing the epidemiology of uh, these diseases associated with our Western lifestyle. And, uh, and related to that, one, one graph that Marty likes to show uh, is, um, one figure Marty likes to show is this pair of graphs, where, uh, where on the left-hand side, what you're seeing is um, documentation, however, uh, how from the 1950s um, through the uh, last half of the 20th century, one disease after another uh, caused by a single pathogen through advances in public health and advances in medicine was brought under control to very low incidence rates. While at the same time, we see a spectacular explosion in so-called um, chronic non-communicable diseases, uh, including multiple sclerosis, Crohn's disease, type 1 diabetes, uh, asthma, and so forth. And so, um, and so we, do, we don't believe anymore in the original version of the hygiene hypothesis, the idea that being infected with pathogens per se uh, was something that would help uh, strengthen your immune system and make you less susceptible to autoimmune disorders. But the idea that uh, unintended consequences of trying to control pathogens, um, especially, uh, especially over use of antibiotics and overzealous hygiene procedures, might be cutting us off from the good microbes, that version of the hygiene hypothesis is gaining more and more currency. Um, so, uh, so then, then, then we come to the question: uh, How can we, how can we reshape the microbiome, and uh, can we do that through diet? And uh, there's quite a substantial body of literature now uh, suggesting that uh, short-term diet doesn't have a very large impact on your microbiome, but the long-term diet is one of the largest influences uh, that we can identify that has a role in uh, what microbes you have and what relative abundance those microbes have. And um, and the, the supplies, so um, so part of, part of the problem uh, part of the problem with this type of research is that uh, the microbiome of mice is extremely easy to manipulate with diet, so that one day after you switch mouse's diet, um, it, it goes uh, its, its microbiome follows along uh, very nicely, and it, it largely does that independent of the mouse's genotype. So uh, this is work we did with Jake Lucis um, almost a decade ago now, published in Cell Metabolism, where what you're looking at is data from 50 different uh, genetic strains of mice 
uh, that were kept either on a high fat, high sugar diet in blue or on a mouse chow diet in red. And what you can see is a big blue cluster and a big red cluster uh, corresponding to the two diets. Uh, what you don't see, which you would see if genotype was driving, is a whole lot of pairs with one blue and one red uh, dot, which would basically tell you that mice with the same genotype have the same microbiome irrespective of diet. So it's very clear uh, that, that mice at least uh, diet has an overriding effect, even in a metabolically diverse panel of genotypes. And um, this is also, um, uh, and uh, we, we also see this very strong diet effect in, in humans. So this is work we did with, um, with Gary Wu, Rick Bushman, and Jim Lewis at uh, Penn that came out in Science about, uh, about a decade ago, where uh, looking, at looking at the gut microbiomes of 100 people, we were able to show that the overriding factor uh, was dietary, and that there were particular microbes that correlated with, for example, high-protein diets like Bacteroides, uh, versus high carbohydrate diets like Prevotella. Uh, however, when we decided to, um, to, to uh, take a subset of these people into the lab and manipulate their diet, uh, what we saw was very disappointing. So, um, so uh, the, the principal coordinates graph that you see is colored by individual. And what you can see is that with the dietary intervention where subjects were placed either on low fat diet or on high fat diet, um, basically, uh, all of the points for the same subject are in the same location, so you get this cluster of the same color. Uh, you don't get a cluster of all the people who are on low-fat diets separating from all the people on high-fat diet, uh, like you would if we had done this experiment in mice. So uh, this is an important reminder that people are not, uh, are not mice, and uh, what you have to do to shift their microbiome around uh, is, is substantially different. Now, um, the graph on the right-hand side is uh, showing statistical justification for the idea that the diet had a, st a statistically significant impact where the difference between the day one sample at baseline and the other days was always larger than the differences between other days. But uh, essentially what this means is that although we could detect the dietary effect, it wasn't large compared to the differences between individuals. And um, you might be familiar with, uh, with, with this paper um, from Pete Turnbow's lab, which is a very nice piece of work uh, making, the, uh, making the central claim that uh, diet, um, uh, diet rapidly and reproducibly alters the human gut microbiome. But uh, one, one catch to it is that uh, the outcome measure here is beta diversity, which is a measure of dissimilarity among samples. And so what you're seeing on the left-hand side is switching people to, um, to, to a vegan diet, which had very little impact. And on the right-hand side, they switched them to an all meat, cheese, and egg diet, uh, which you can see, um, which you can see had uh, a large impact on the beta diversity. But it's important to remember that what this means is that it's uh, a change in uh, it's 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 uh, a change in a measure that relates samples to each other. And so, what it's saying is that you have an impact on the microbiome, but it doesn't say what direction that impact is in. And uh, when we replot some of the data using the techniques I showed you before. Uh, on the left-hand side, we're looking at the trace from one subject where the blue is the vegan diet, the red is the all meat and cheese diet. Um, and you can see that uh, the, the uh, region they cover in red space is a lot bigger than the region in blue space. So that means there's a lot more variability uh, on that diet. And then the same is true for a second subject. Um, let's see, sorry, i just try to, the animation doesn't quite want to play in sequence. There we go. So, so for a second subject, again, you see that the, uh, the space that's traversed uh, on the vegan diet in blue is not as big as the uh, space traversed in the um, meat, egg, and cheese diet in red. But then if we ask uh, for all the subjects together, are those changes in the same direction or not? Uh, what we see is a pattern very similar to what I showed you in, in uh, the Wu et al. paper, where you see clusters of points that are the same color, which correspond to the same subject. And then when I play all the animations, you see that they move more uh, on, on, the, uh, in, in, on, on the red traces, which is meat, eggs, and cheese diet, than in the green, uh, than in the green traces, which is a vegan diet. But, they are, but uh, the direction that they move on a given diet is different for different people, and it's all over the map. So in other words, uh, even though you can say something about the size of the change in the microbiome that you can induce with a particular diet, you cannot say anything about the direction that that diet is going to send you in. And that's a really big problem because we expect that the kinds of microbes you have, which corresponds to the direction in the space, is going to be at least as important as uh, how big the change was. 
And um, and I mentioned this uh, the, this paper uh, the, this paper earlier. Um, so uh, so especially if we get to try to move people from uh, being uh, being responders to, uh, be, being non responders to being responders for a particular diet or other intervention, um, given that uh, given that your response depends on your microbiome, uh, what we really need to do is develop tools that are not just like uh, whacking uh, you know whacking a machine with a hammer and seeing that it's going to move in some direction, but being able to be much more precise size and uh, having the ability to send it in a particular direction uh, so that we can use these predictive models um, on the end state to say that now that your microbiome's changed in a desirable way, now we can predict uh, what the impact of, a different, uh, of each different food item is going to be on you individually. Um, okay, so uh, so uh, so um, so so as as a result uh, of, of this need to study the complexity that links microbiome and diet and Alzheimer's disease, um, two years ago uh, with funding from NIA, uh, we launched the Alzheimer's Gut Microbiome Project, and um, essentially uh, essentially the goal of this project is try to uh, try uh, try to um, untangle the relationships between these uh, these three very complex things because the microbiome contains a dizzying array of organisms, genes, and metabolic function. Uh, diet itself is an incredibly complex um, uh, variable that it's difficult to uh, even come up with repeatable measures to read it out. And uh, Alzheimer's disease, as you know, uh, has a very complicated uh, presentation of phenotypes. Uh, there are many comorbidities. Um, untangling any one of these layers is very challenging, and then trying to understand them all at once is even more challenging. So, uh, so the approach that we're taking is to uh, leverage a lot of existing infrastructure that's already funded by um, uh, by uh, NIA, and so so this 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 so this includes NCRAD, which is basically collecting uh, collecting biospecimens and aliquoting them. Um, the uh, the the NACC, um, which uh, coordinates a lot of these activities. Um, the uh, the uh, ADGC and ADSP uh, on uh, on host genomic sequencing, uh, and uh, and and of course the um, the the ADRCs, uh, which are um, which uh, feed into this overall hub infrastructure, and so um, and so basically uh, and, and so basically uh, what we're requesting of the participating ADRCs uh, is biospecimens that will go to NCRAD. Uh, will be aliquoted to NCRAD and then will be distributed for a broad range of molecular assays. Um, the, uh, the the kits uh, so so the um, so the kits that we were uh, we're, we're asking you to uh, to use with your subjects um, these are based on the um, of the American Gut Project and MicroZeta Initiative uh, kit development uh, for collecting at home microbiome samples. And especially with the COVID situation worsening yet again, uh, this at-home collection aspect uh, we, we think is, uh, is, is really important for broadening participation um, because we, we have these validated kits that have been used uh, that, that have been used by many people, uh, including um, including many uh, many older people, uh, successfully um, in, in the context of being able to collect the, their biospecimens at home rather than necessarily needing to, uh, to bring them in for a clinical visit. Um, we can also do blood collections. So this is, a, this is a finger stick assay that's very similar to the blood collection that you would do uh, for an at-home diabetes test, for example, which many people are familiar with. Um, and uh, that blood spot is collected onto a membrane uh, that stabilizes it at room temperature and uh, makes it possible to do metabolomic, um, metaproteomic, and a wide range of other uh, assays on it. And, um, we, uh, we, we can also do for research from these biospecimens, um, we can do SARS-CoV-2 assays, so we can do serology uh, to figure out whether someone's been exposed to SARS-CoV-2 in the past. Uh, we can also do a qPCR assay uh, of, of a nasal swab, for example, um, collected, uh, collected via this mechanism. Although, um, uh, or, although uh, the, these are research assays, these are not clinical diagnostic tests for SARS-CoV-2. Um, one, one thing we'd appreciate your feedback on is, uh, so, so many of you have probably used the, uh, the vending machines um, at, at UCSD that go through the Excite Lab, uh, which I co-direct together with uh, Louise Laurent and uh, Jean Yeo, um, uh, where, uh, where we can do a clinical test uh, in, in that setup uh, with, with the, uh, with, with the self-collection from the vending machine scan. Um, if it would be useful to uh, make that available to participants either to assess their status 
or to drive participation given the general unavailability of tests. Uh, we can certainly look into modifying the EUA to, uh, to allow us to do those by mail, although at the moment the EUA only covers local collection and pickup. Um, uh, so, uh, so that we're concerned about things like uh, what would the test performance be in sub-freezing conditions? And we pointed out that we don't get those very often in La Jolla, but, um, and they were willing to accept that, but uh, to do it by mail, they, uh, they require more uh, stringent environmental controls than we've done so far. Uh, but, but anyway, so, um, so, so the kits leverage our uh, experience in the American Gut Project and then the MicroZeta initiative, where we've now done uh, at-home collections with about 30,000 people at this point. And, uh, the, um, and so the uh, HDMP consists of, of three projects. So, um, so, so the first project is uh, the one that we're primarily uh, requesting your assistance with. And uh, the idea is to recruit 1,200 subjects um, each at two time points and collect blood and feces from each of those subjects. And so, um, and so we're doing this across uh, many of the ADRCs. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to get a representative cross-section of, uh, of stages of Alzheimer's disease and to get, a, uh, get an understanding of how much change there is uh, within a person under, um, un under business as usual parameters. And the reason, uh, the, the reason why we think this is really important is that for many other diseases we've looked at progression in, uh, including things like IBD, uh, where this, uh, where, where this complex um, uh, dynamic features of the course of IBD that are revealed by the microbiome, but also with, uh, with um, uh, conditions with nervous system involvement like multiple sclerosis and Parkinson's, we're able to do a pretty good job of staging uh, based on the gut microbiome. And so establishing whether this is also true for AD uh, as well as uh, as well as for um, as well as understanding uh, how can we uh, disentangle AD from frequent comorbidities, including things like anxiety and depression, both of which have been linked to gut microbiome changes and gut metabolism changes, uh, is a really important um, is, is a really important uh, aim of that uh, of that project. Uh, in project two, uh, what we're doing is we're piggybacking on three. Uh, large clinical trials of diet interventions where the diet is known to modify AAD. And what we're doing is we're looking at the, uh, the impact of those diets on the gut microbiome and or metabolome. And so uh, we're looking at 1,000 subjects in the US pointer trial, 120 subjects in the BTAD trial, and 604 subjects in the MIND trial, uh, where, the, uh, where, where the idea is that we can, um, we can uh, look at samples at baseline and uh, periodically through the dietary intervention, including information about uh, information about adherence to the diet uh, that we can reveal through the metabolomics as well as through self-reports. And uh, then the third project is much more mechanistic, and this is being led by Sarkis Masmani at Caltech, who I mentioned earlier, where, uh, where what we're doing is focusing on mice that have uh, microbiomes from individual humans, either AD patients or uh, controls who are matched for phenotype. Um, transplanted into those initially germ-free mice. And so uh, with the mice, we're harvesting many tissues, including, um, in, including the liver and the brain, for example. And, uh, we're able, and so this, this gives us uh, much more detail on the mechanistic links between the activity of the gut microbiome and uh, particular aspects of AD pathogenesis, at least to the extent that the, uh, that the mice are a reasonable model of AD, which, um, uh, which uh, of, of course, there are limitations there but uh, still we think it's going to provide useful information about specific mechanistic pathways. So, um, so uh, just, uh, just giving you a bit more um, in information about the uh, diet and microbiome studies, uh, the goal of all of these taken together is to uh, look at the influence of, um, of controlled diets on, uh, on, the on the gut microbiome and on the metabolome, and then also relate these to either slowing and progression of AD symptoms or uh, reversal of AD symptoms, focusing primarily on cognitive function, uh, but also um, also looking at, at mood and affect and uh, um, and uh, other um, uh, other neuropsychiatric parameters. So um, so so mind is the um, is, is the uh, Mediterranean uh, uh, Dash diet intervention. So it's basically comparing the Mediterranean diet and the Dash diet. Um, Beat is focused primarily on uh, on energy, so it's uh, it's it's focused on um, focused on mitochondrial function, 
uh, and then pointer uh, again as a comparison of multiple uh, multiple different dietary interventions uh, with a control arm that basically uh, that basically allows the, the effects of those Thank interventions. Um, so, uh, so I'm just wrapping this up so that we'll have time for questions. This is uh, this is a sense of who's involved in this. So the uh, PIs and myself, uh, Sarkis Masmanian and uh, Rima um, uh, uh, Kadara Dauk uh, at uh, Duke University, uh, who's the um, who's the overall PI of this effort. And uh, we have a lot of partners um, around the country and around the world, uh, including um, including many of the ADRCs. Um, I won't read out every name on this list, but one uh, one one really uh, exciting aspect of this um, of this consortium is that we've been able to bring in a lot of uh, international partners, including uh, including people who are uh, doing various aspects of uh, brain imaging analysis, um, uh, metabolic pathway reconstruction, uh, genome scale uh, 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 ge um, genome scale inference of uh, metabolomics, and uh, relationships among all of these different data layers. And uh, um, and uh, in, in my lab, uh, we, we have a remarkable team of people uh, working on all of this stuff and uh, pushing the technology forward. And uh, it's uh, really a privilege to be able to work with all of them. So um, so with, with that, uh, I'd like to thank you again for the uh, samples that you've provided so far, uh, which are primarily focused on people in your cohort who are healthy. Um, we, we, we would additionally uh, really like uh, to request a focus on being able to get some specimens from people who do have uh, AD, um, who, who do have AD phenotypes, because uh, if we only continue to get uh, samples from the healthy controls, which we understand, uh, which we completely understand are much easier to collect, but uh, without those samples from patients exhibiting diseases, uh, we're not going to be able to uh, fulfill the aims of the project in terms of um, understanding what particular features are uh, linked to AD, and, um, and and so we really we really need those additional samples. Uh, we we also uh, we also have a pilot project with David Gonzalez, who's an expert on, met uh, on metaproteomics, um, which is not part of the U uh, nineteen but is linked to it. And um, in, in that project, we're very interested in looking at looking not just at the DNA, but also at the proteins that are produced by microbes associated with AD. And has been able to uh, demonstrate successfully uh, that, that, that that protocol works on your uh, control samples. But we also need batch samples from AD patients to be able to see anything that's specific to AD. And uh, we really appreciate your partnership in that going forward. Um, so, uh, so thanks again for the invitation to uh, connect with you at this lunch and learn and, uh, and uh, be delighted to uh, answer questions for the rest of the time.